Have you ever seen a fire? Have you heard a fire speak to you? Huh. I have. And it wouldn't let me know where near. I've actually been down to our home and what we saw, we just, we just cannot believe it. There were people in our newsroom who were saying, there's something not right about this. But it wasn't until I stood back and realised that it was just one big fix. They both look scared. <laughs> In a cemetery a few miles from the centre of Derby lie six graves. Each of the headstones marks the final resting place of a family of children. Flowers and toys to remember children killed as they slept. The fire started, police believe, when petrol was poured through the letterbox. The police are saying this is a potential murder investigation with the cause of the fire yet to be confirmed. The events that led to the children's deaths began back in May 2003, when a 19-year-old single mother called Maraid Duffy married her fiancé. I went myself uh, to give her away in that there. Went to a wedding and then uh, there was a reception held in a club on Elton Road when we came back in that there. And there was quite a few people there and that. You know, there were kind of one crowd sitting here of a family and another family sitting somewhere else kind of thing. Jimmy's daughter had just married Mick Philpot, a man with a sinister past. Kim Hill was his partner when he was 21 and in the army in the late 70s. She was 17. She had the temerity to send him a Dear John letter, ending their relationship. He responded by um, stabbing her 15 times, and when her mother tried to intervene, attacked her, seriously injuring her as well. And he went to prison for that. He received a prison sentence of seven years for attempted murder. Phil Potts' conviction did little to change his attitude to women. He is so egocentric. Everything uh, he does is, is important in the sense that it's got to relate to him and how he feels. And he has absolutely no compunction in doing anything to hurt somebody else. We know this because he's you know, hurt multiple partners in the past. And he has absolutely no remorse. And because of this combination, this makes him dangerous because he has no ability to really see somebody else's perspective. And because he has no ability to see somebody else's perspective and no remorse, this is not going to stop him when he starts hurting somebody else. Whether his new bride was aware of Phil Potts' history is unknown. But even on their wedding day, Maraid's father was concerned. He seemed to be mingling around everywhere and among the women, stuff like that there. And uh, half the time she was sitting there on her own and he was nowhere near her. I said to him, I said, you're supposed to be with your wife today. I said, so you're going around all these women and they did quite annoy me. I, you know, it was in two minds of saying I'm going to whack him one the minute, but I decided not to ruin the day kind of thing, so I just kind of bit my tongue and left it at that. Everything that Mick does really is centred on Mick. Once you understand that, you can see why he behaves the way that he does. So bearing that in mind, then everything that he does, he has no understanding of how it impacts on other people. And even if he does understand it, then he wouldn't care. Already a father of five by the time he was 40, Mick Philpott had become adept at choosing the type of women who he could manipulate. They always seemed to go for young girls. That was vulnerable. There was always 16, 17-year-olds, or like Marie, she'd just come out of a relationship which was abusive, so he pretended to be there for her, and then he ended up abusing her in, in some way anyway. 
So he just went for the young guns, really, that he could control. He flattered them. They would be attracted to him because he gave them the attention, maybe attention they didn't have before in their life. And very quickly, he would get them on side, he'd move them in, and very soon he would start to control them. Mick Philpott's obsessive and abusive behaviour left a trail of broken relationships in his wake. He's also a very, very controlling man, and he will control every aspect of a, of a partner's life. The finances, where they work, where they live, who they see, where they go, everything about them. And he's done this on multiple occasions with, with different partners. He used to do all the shopping. He'd do the food shopping. He, he had control of all the money. The girls didn't get no money. If they wanted something, they'd have to ask. And it was up to him whether he said yes or no to whether they got it. He sat there, but he gave the orders out, you know, to whoever cooked the tea. You wash the pots, you do this and you do that sort of thing. I think his extreme narcissism is also coming from a potential position of fear. He doesn't ever want to be left. He can't tolerate any rejection and he's got a very sensitive, potentially injured sense of self. And in the course of his life, unfortunately, multiple people get hurt in order for him to operate the way he does. Philpott met Mairead Duffy in the year 2000 and she quickly fell under his spell. The pair moved into 18 Victory Road and whilst at first glance the relationship was a happy one, behind closed doors it was a different story. To a certain extent, yes, I think she was scared. She was controlled by Mick and she didn't have a life of her own. They were all trying to get her out and out there. Even the woman across the road was trying to get her out. She said she could get her a safe house, that she could go there with the children and she'd be safe and out there, but she wouldn't budge. She said, no, I'm stopping where I am. She had a job working as a cleaner at uh, one of the local hospitals, which, by all accounts, she absolutely loved. She was a happy-go-lucky person when she was at work, um, and then her demeanour would completely change and she'd go quiet and silent when she used to have to finish work and go and get picked up by Mick. I can remember going round once and Mairead, um, she had bruises all up her face and made out she got attacked going to the garage one night. Um, but she never did admit it was Mick, but, you know, I, I assumed and so did husband. We thought it was a bit strange going to a garage at half two in the morning. Um, so I think she was just covering up for Mick. In 2002, the domestic arrangements at 18 Victory Road became even stranger when Mick moved his 16-year-old mistress, Lisa Willis, into the house. She would even act as a bridesmaid to Mick and Mairead when the couple married a year later. Both of them started families with, uh, with Mick and it got to a stage where there were 11 children living in the house. Everybody just kind of said, well, they all seem to be getting on very well together, you know? And we, well, we all took a back foot and said, you know, as long as they can, we can see the kids are all right then, the two women are all right, you know, let them get on with it. But we were all, you know, weird, you know, I, I couldn't do anything like that. And the kids would say we couldn't kind of thing, you know, but it was something we got used to over a period of time. My understanding is it's quite a harmonious house although congested because you had 11 children in there at one stage plus three adults, hence Mick having a caravan outside the front of the house that he would live in and sleep in and, in his own words, alternate nights, he'd have a different woman in there, whether it was his mistress or whether it was Mairead. These unusual living arrangements began to attract the attention of the local community and the situation wasn't helped by Mick's seemingly insatiable appetite for publicity. We ran a story in 2006 where Mick Philpott came to us to say that he wanted a bigger council house. At the time, he was living at 18 Victory Road and he was living there with his wife, Mairead, their children that he had at the time, plus his mistress and the children that he had with his mistress at the time. Um, on the back of our story, the Nationals picked it up the following day 
and ran with it. One of the tabloids dubbed him Shameless Mick after the TV programme. And on the, on the back of that, the media appearances for Mick and Maraid spiralled, really. He was just all about Mick, wasn't it? You know, he was, you know, if he wasn't the centre of attention, it wasn't really worth entertaining in his eyes. But, you know, his kids was looked after in our eyes. Uh, he was doing the right thing by his children. Even though he was unemployed, you know, his kids didn't want for anything. So, you know, no one really seen, you know, anything wrong in what Mick was doing. But the real truth is, is most of the ladies thought he was a pervert. The lads knew what he was because he, he never really confronted any male in any aggressive shape or form because he was a coward. He could only do it with women. Although the adults' relationship at 18 Victory Road was unusual, there appears to be no question that life for the children living in the house was anything other than happy. Oh, those little angels, they're so well-behaved children. I'm saying there's so many in the house. They were just really, really well-behaved. They was all well looked after, all fed. You could walk past them, you'd see them all in the window you know, bouncing around the settees or they was on the street playing football and, you know, you, they wasn't not looked after. You know, they was always happy, they, they never wanted for nothing. But in the early hours of the 11th of May, the people who lived on Victory Road were woken by an awful sight, a sight that would change their lives forever. I looked out the window and then I seen about a foot high flame coming from the front door and I just knew whose ass it was straight away. In February 2012, Phil Potts' mistress, Lisa Willis, decided that enough was enough. His mistress was always the strongest one out of the pair of them. And they always said one day she will up and leave. Um, I think she just had enough. She got older, she got wiser and just had enough of the controlling situation and just chose to get out with the kids. Willis left 18 Victory Road along with the five children she shared with Mick. Philpot was furious and he wanted revenge. But he also wanted the benefits payments that he'd lost when Lisa took her children away. He was constantly on and on about it, you know, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we have to do this and that to get the uh, children back. And I think maybe it was pointing some of the blame at Maria. If you hadn't have been here, she might have uh, stayed kind of thing. Mick and Maraid Philpot, along with their six children, stayed at the house on Victory Road. Furious that Willis had left, Mick began legal proceedings to gain custody of their five children. A court hearing was set, but it was a date that neither party would attend. In the early hours of the 11th of May, the very day of the hearing, Neighbours woke to a horrifying sight. I looked out the window and then I seen about a foot high flame coming from the front door and I just knew whose arse it was straight away. My brother was waking up frantically and to me it sounded a lot saying it was a fire fire. You know, because I was still off sleep, I've got up thinking the fire was actually in our house. But when I heard him say, no, mix house, look out the window. And I just seen somebody stood on the front, female, dressed and said, where's Mick, where's the kids? In the ass, in the ass. When I first seen it out the window, you know, I was looking through sleepy eyes. I could see flames at the door. When I got over there, you know, and it was only a matter of minutes, we were speaking like the, the door was ablaze, you know, and there was smoke coming right out of the windows, you know. So within a matter of minutes, it just gone up like that. Neighbours rushed to 18 Victory Road, which was now consumed by fire. They desperately tried to get into the house to rescue the six children who were asleep upstairs. With that, I ran next door because there was a caravan. His caravan was obviously there blocking access. I jumped upon the caravan straight over and I just seen him and Maraid in the back garden like, and I didn't think at the time, I just thought, well, these kids in there. And then when I jumped over, he says, oh, they're all in the back bedroom. And I thought to myself, you know, what? No, he weren't helping in any way. Went into the conservatory, because it was like a maze. He had a pool table one side and conservatory another side. 
dogs barking here, there, smoke, alarms going off, smoke coming out, parrot squawking. But at that time, you know, I wasn't thinking, I was just thinking, get in and try and help the kids. And it just didn't work. You know, the more I was going in, the more I was coming back. Have you ever seen a fire? Have you heard a fire speak to you? Yeah. I have. And it wouldn't let me nowhere near him. Nowhere. Just a howling and come on closer and you're dead. You wouldn't know until you smell it. It's like putting your mouth over a car exhaust and <sighs> bearing in mind I never had no t-shirt or nothing to cover my mouth. I was going nowhere. And my heart was just beating faster and faster, thinking, come on, just push forward, push forward. Despite the valiant attempts of neighbours, the raging inferno that engulfed 18 Victory Road would claim the lives of six children who'd been asleep upstairs. Jade Philpot, who was 10, John, 9, Jack, 8, Jesse, 6, and five-year-old Jaden died at the scene. The eldest child, 13-year-old Dwayne, Mairead's son from a previous relationship, was critically injured. Two on one trolley. Two on one trolley. The last one, Dwayne, on the pavement for 10 minutes. And I was trying to pump life into him. Despite the frantic activity outside the house, onlookers began to question the actions of Mick and Mairead. I realised straight away the parents weren't doing nothing. But I thought to myself, why aren't you holding on to my side saying, please, my kids, my kids? I've got kids. But as sure as I am sat here now, if you would have touched me on my shoulder once, said, my kids, please help me, I wouldn't be sat here today, brother. It wasn't until I got off the caravan that I came out to the side of the neighbour's garden that I actually seen Mick coming out the front as I was going in the front. You know, and, it, and his, um, it was then, straight away then, that I knew, like, you know, it's so much wrong there, like, the way he come out, that garden, when I came in, he didn't look like a guy that was coughing, like he was pretending to be. The way that I seen Mairead, it was just frozen. You know, when I asked her how many kids are now, she said six. I said, where? She says, all in the back bedroom. You know, there was no reaction from her. Within an hour after it happened, me and my brother looked at each other and said, did you see what I just seen? And we did not spoke, and I said, yeah. Is it right what we were thinking? I apologise to that boy, you know, for not being able to touch his kids in any way. I held him. And it was like holding a brick wall. And that son of a bitch destroyed my life. Destroyed it. Because that little girl was right there, near that window, and I couldn't touch her. Couldn't lay my hands on her. I'm so glad they weren't screaming. That's all. So that would have done it then. In the confusion outside 18 Victory Road, friends and neighbours who had tried so hard to save the children began to realise there was something dreadfully wrong. Whilst they had risked their lives trying to get into the house, the children's parents had stood by and watched. But it wasn't until I stood back and realised that it was just one big fix. They both looked scared because they knew they'd made the ultimate fuck up. If you're going to do a move like that, if, whether it's to get back at your ex partner that's left you, your girlfriend, so you've not got a girlfriend and a wife no more, you get the kids out the house. Whether it's to get a bigger house, you get the kids out the house. Make them set their aunties. You know, you don't set fire to the pissing house with the kids in it thinking you can stop it. You can't. Now, he looked shocked, mate, and that's what struck me. You know, and he knew, I've known him for years, and he looked in my eyes and he, I knew, you know, I've got your ticket here, mate. With the inferno finally out, police officers began to search for clues that they hoped would reveal how the fire that had killed five children and critically injured one more had started. They quickly realised that the blaze was not an accident. The fire had started at the front door. The police 
confirmed that quite early on as part of their investigation. Um, it also became quite clear that the police confirmed quite early on that the fire had been started deliberately, or that was their belief. Um, of course, there was a joint police and fire investigation. Once it became apparent that it had been started deliberately, the investigation went on to you know, who could have started this. Because there were two arrests very early on, there was an assumption that the mistress was behind it and that it was the mistress that had been arrested. The two arrests came to nothing. Philpott's mistress, Lisa Willis, and the second person were released without charge, leaving police desperate to find who had started the fire. As the rumour mill round Victory Road went into overdrive, the actions of Mick and Maraid grew increasingly bizarre, despite the eldest child, Dwayne, fighting for his life in hospital. Dwayne was transferred to Birmingham Hospital, and at the time, Mick didn't want to go because he had a court appearance in the morning. So he, he said to Marie, do you go? Um, and then, it, like, obviously, they told him, you know, you must go. And I, in near enough, literally, I had to be forced into the car to uh, go to Birmingham. My youngest daughter said that uh, her and her mammy went up at 2 o'clock and uh, Maria and Mick were in with Dwayne and she said, you want us to take over for an hour or two so she can go and freshen up and get a cup of tea and that there. They never came back till 11 o'clock that night. And my youngest daughter said she could tell them either way what they'd been doing because Maria did all that uh, on her neck. Unfortunately, there's been a, a severe deterioration in the condition of Dwayne. Um, he's been at hospital now, obviously, since the fire. And in essence now, he's only being kept alive by a life support machine, which is very, very sad. Dwayne Philpott lost his fight for life on the 14th of May, three days after the fire. As the police investigation continued, his parents seemingly had no idea that the finger of suspicion was pointing directly at them. There was a huge amount of outpouring of grief in the community and further beyond for, for Mick and Maraid. They'd lost their, their six children in the house fire who, who wouldn't have sympathy for them. But then during that time, they'd been put into a hotel room in the, the Derby Hospital where the, where the children's bodies were taken after the fire. There were rumours starting to circulate that Mick was going to different places and asking people for money. We know that you went to the travelling community and was given thousands of pounds by them, so they'd rallied round to support him. We'd heard that he'd been to one of the local supermarkets asking for handouts, asking for clothes. There was also a rumour that he was offered some clothes by one of the local supermarkets, but then turned them down because the clothes weren't good enough for him. You had the Sikh community, you had the uh, Asian community, you had the Gypsy community that chucked thousands, uh, a few thousand pounds to him that night because he'd lost his, f uh, his family, his ass and everything. They'd been out shopping, they'd been down the pub singing karaoke, they'd been down to Victory Roads to barbecues and that there. I was upstairs at my mum's house and there was a knock on the door. My, my cousin answered it, actually, who was staying that night at my mum's house, saying, Mick and Maraid's here. Now, this is a week after the fire, after what's all going through my head. And they come around to thank me and my brother for making the effort. Now, when they come in my mum's kitchen, there was not one bit of emotion in Maraid or one single emotion in Mick. Now, if I'd have lost six kids, right, there's no way that I could be standing without puffy eyes a week after thanking someone, looking all pretty, smiling. I had to embrace Marie. They didn't embrace me. Mick tried to fake uh, a cry. Oh, it was the same thing that I seen that night. Detectives had initially arrested Lisa Willis, but with her alibi confirmed, suspicion began to fall onto Mick and Maraid, especially now that police had proved the fire had been started inside the house. They, along with another man, Paul Mosley, a family friend who had been at the house that night, were placed under covert surveillance, which included bugging a hotel where the Philpots were staying. During the, the time that they were in the hotel, the police made some uh, undercover recordings of them, which were used as key evidence in the trial. 
They included um, Mairead having sex with Paul Mosley in the hotel room while Mick was there. And they also include a lot of whispered conversations which were analysed by prosecution and defence experts. What did you say? Tell me what you said to me. What did you say about how many times you went up ladders? I can't lost count how many times you went up the ladders. What did you say about me trying to go in? You tried everything you could to get in there. I said to him I wanted to run through the flames. He was heard saying things like, are we sticking to the story? Um, what did you tell the police? What did you tell them? How, much, how, how badly did you cry? Did you really cry your eyes out? What did you cry when you were saying it? How bad? Not really, really bad, but did cry. Circle. If the Philpots were in any way involved with the fire, they were doing little to hide their guilt. You know, who's going around to people's houses bragging about having all this money? They was in town shopping, singing at, at, at my mate's, oh, it's unreal. My mate's daughter got christened and he was singing karaoke, Suspicious Minds. You've got to be happy when you sing. How's he happy after six children dying, going out shopping, bragging about money? As if this wasn't bad enough, on the 16th of May, five days after the fire, the Philpots themselves called a press conference at the Derby Conference Centre. For all that witnessed it, it would become a defining moment in the case. We got there, we really didn't know what to expect, but the Philpots were brought in, as I'm sure everyone's seen, there were the cameras flashing, um, dictaphones going, you could hear the journalists scribbling in their notebooks. He pretty much collapsed straight away when he started talking, he thanked, people like the Butler brothers who helped him on the night to try and get the children out. To see this community to, to come together like they have, it's just, it's just too overwhelming. In hindsight, one of the most telling things about the whole of the press conference was how he never once paid any tribute to the children. He didn't name them, he didn't mention them. It was all over in four minutes and 55 seconds. Mick kept putting his hands over his face and leaning forward. Mairead had her head bowed, she'd occasionally look up at at Mick, and I think it's after that press conference that a few people looked at each other, and I certainly, when we got back to the new, when I got back to the newsroom where they'd been watching it live on television, there were people in our newsroom who were saying, there's something not right about this. And of course, the poor firemen, the police, the ambulances, the doctors, the nurses, literally everybody who's, who tried to try to help so that children they couldn't. To me it was a show because I couldn't see a tear. I never heard a mention of the children or find out who'd done this to me children. And I thought to myself, what's wrong with the man? Six children are dead. Somebody set the house on fire. No mention of the children, no sign of a tear. And I don't think there was a tear coming out of my head either. But she just sat there with her head down, clinging on to him. Let it excuse me a minute. The thing that I saw there was him being histrionic. This is a slightly separate thing to being narcissistic, and he has some traits of being histrionic as well. And what he was doing in that TV interview was he was really trying to show some emotion. And because he finds that hard, he gets it a little bit wrong. And so what he does is he, he overdoes it. So then he sort of then he, he sort of comes out with all of the tears and all of the the histrionic sort of element to him um, because he thinks that's what people expect. But if you look very, very carefully at him when he's doing that, there are no tears at all. So he's um, he's wiping tears away, but he forgets that when you cry, your tears go down the inside of your nose and you have to wipe your nose as well. He's, he's not quite worked that out, and so he wipes his eyes, but forgets to wipe his nose. What Philpot didn't realise was that as he revelled in the media spotlight, he was also being studied by the police. Because at the time of the press conference, he was their prime suspect. It was a knock on the door at my mum's house, and it was just a routine, did you see it that night? And I said to that routine officer, look, me and my brother need to speak to someone because what I seen that night was wrong. And before you know it, we had 
uh, Murder Squad coming to interview us, the CID. And I'm glad, I'm glad, it, I'm glad it happened. Yeah. On the 29th of May, two weeks after the fire, detectives felt they had enough evidence. Mick and Maraid Philpot were both arrested and charged with murdering their six children. I recall sitting at my desk, an email pinging from the police press office, opening it up and saying, seeing a 55-year-old man and a 31-year-old woman have been arrested on suspicion of murder and just standing up and shouting over to them, literally standing up and going, the Philpots have been arrested for murder. It weren't a shock when um, they got arrested. We were supposed to meet him that morning um, and I'd rang the phones had switched off and I said to my husband, they've been arrested. You know, they've finally been arrested. Later on that day, we found out that he had been arrested and Marie had too. And then I think it was two days later, um, we were sat watching 10 o'clock news and then it said on there that they've both been charged. Um, and I was just glad that they finally caught up with them. Only days later, a third man, Paul Mosley, a friend of the couple who was present at the house on the night of the fire, was also arrested on suspicion of murder. Their charges were later downgraded to manslaughter, meaning prosecutors didn't have to prove that the three accused actually intended to kill the six children, but only that they were responsible for their deaths. Trial took place at Nottingham Crown Court. It started on February the 11th, 2013 which ironically was a year to the day that Mick's former mistress had walked out on him with the children. The courtroom that morning was just bristling, just the whole air of anticipation. You know, here is a man and his wife and his friend who were charged with the manslaughter of, of six of their children. The second that that dock opened and that the three of them walked in, so they're flanked by dock officers, everyone was craning their neck, everyone wanted to see what they were wearing, what they looked like. As the trial began, the whole sordid story of life at 18 Victory Road was laid bare. Local radio reporter turned around to me and said, this whole story makes Shameless look like Downton Abbey. And I think it's a line that stuck with me throughout the whole of the trial. And that's very much how I view the relationship that Paul Mosley had with the Philpots. It, it, it was seedy. There was dogging involved, there was three-way sex, possibly more, uh, who, who knows, but it, it, was just, it was just a relationship that I couldn't possibly comprehend me having with anyone. Their police interviews, recorded after the arrests, only served to strengthen the prosecution's case against the accused. I think the police interviews were interesting. What the barrister for the prosecution did bring out in those interviews was the startling similarity in what Mick and Maraid said when they first observed the fire. They both said that they saw a bright orange light. And they both also said that they heard a pop. Now, what they were describing actually was the ignition of the fire. Oh, they wouldn't have seen that from the other side of the room unless they set the fire. And they both described it in exactly the same terms. The barrister very rightly pointed that out and accused them of colluding with regard to their testimony. And that's absolutely right to do that. We saw some video evidence of him being interviewed. Well, they didn't quite pick up on this, but um, he gave a very revealing gesture. And he, he said, um, I saw the, the fire across the room. Um, and he said, I saw the fire across the room. <laughs> and he gestured the fire coming up towards his face. And of course, it, it couldn't possibly have done that from 20, 30 foot away. He was describing the fire igniting underneath him. But one of the most damning pieces of evidence that was brought before the court was the 999 call made by Maraid Philpot on the night of the fire. What's your name, Mrs. Philpot. Mrs. Philpot. Mrs. Philpot. Mrs. Philpot. How many kids are in the house, Mrs. Philpot? Where are they? Sorry? 
Mairead was very, very calm in the first part of the call. That's the first thing I thought. The operator says, which service would you like? And Mairead says, all three, please. Later on, you see Mick says, I can't get out. I can't get out. The fire service is away. I can't get out! <laughs> this is not a man who's desperate to get in to the house. This is a man having a panic attack who wants to get out of the situation. I can't get out! <laughs> As the trial progressed, the true horror of what happened on the night of the fire was about to be revealed. Someone, whether it was Mick or Paul or Mairead, had been out and bought some petrol to deliberately start a fire to make it look as though someone had poured petrol through the letterbox and then lit it. Then someone, probably Mick, was going to grab a fire extinguisher and put it out, be the hero, go to court that morning on a custody battle with, with his children that he had with his mistress, use that as a, look at me, aren't I a hero? And it just went tragically wrong. The fire got very quickly out of control. Mick had apparently done some DIY work inside the house. He had painted yacht varnish all the way up the woodwork up the stairs. This is highly flammable and should not be used on interiors. So the fire went straight up the stairs. Unfortunately, that wasn't the worst of it because there was far too much petrol used to ignite the fire. So using petrol to start a fire is one thing, but using the amount of petrol, which we know was used to start this particular fire, uh, was really just asking for trouble. One of the key pieces of evidence that the prosecution brought before the court was the petrol residue that was found on the clothes each of the three defendants were wearing on the night of the fire. Three of them had petrol on their clothing. It, it, it was a very small amount. It wasn't a huge amount. They weren't sloshed all over their jeans or anything. But what the analysts had discovered was that the same type of petrol that was used to start the fire inside the house was also found in small quantities on all three of their, of their clothing. What was the chance that all three people who had been together that evening, we know they'd all been together that evening, what were the chances that they had all got total additive on them? Why would they have this additive, this petrol additive on them? The petrol evidence coupled with testimony from witnesses was enough for the jury. All three defendants were found guilty of six counts of manslaughter. When the first guilty verdict was read out, I was waiting with my mobile phone ready to send it back to our web editor to stick on the web straight away. I remember sending the message, looking over at Mick. Mick's got his arms folded, he's going like that. He isn't saying anything, and he's not showing any facial emotion. When Paul Moses' guilty verdicts were read over, he, he was the only one who showed any emotion. He looked over and was shaking his head. He looked, he, he went pale, but as soon as they were taken from the dock and the courtroom was cleared, I think that's maybe more when the emotion came out. I know one of one of Mairead's sisters, as she was getting led away, said something along the lines of, I knew on, I knew on that morning that you'd done this. And she shouted that in the courtroom before she stormed out. For his role as the driving force in the botched arson attempt, allegedly to frame his mistress, Mick Philpott received a life sentence with the judge describing him as a disturbingly dangerous man with no moral compass. Mairead Philpott and Paul Mosley were each sentenced to 17 years in prison. To friends and relatives, however, the sentences were unduly lenient. Yeah, I burst out in tears. I do. There's no justification in that at all. Divide it into six. You can't do it. 17 years after that, you know, it's only a couple of years a kid, that's not right, man. You know? Well, then she's got to get out living with this on her, on her conscience. But has she got any conscience? You know? Who knows? But they've been sentenced, justice has been paid. But for me, it wasn't long enough, nowhere near long enough. 
when the pasta sentences and that there, we uh, some of us were pleased and said others weren't. Others thought they should have got more. Thought they should have been done for each child individually, instead of you know basically there were six child they got one sentence for the whole six children. A lot of us thought they should have got a sentence for each child, kind of thing, you know. And there was uh, people stood up in court and, you know, justice has been done. Uh, and my daughter went to one and this, that and the other. And uh, all he could do when he was laugh and when he was turning to take him downstairs, putting his finger up to the, uh, to his family and that there, and to us lot. I'll never get over it. I'll try and deal with it, but I'll never get over it. It's there every day in here. Every day, six little babies dead on the tarmac. Nobody can help them. And their own parents did it. And I couldn't help them. Couldn't do nothing. Just stand there and watch. So no, I'll never get over it. But I'll try and deal with it. That's all I can do. Personally, I'd like to kill the man for what he's done to them children and what he's done to me daughter. Because at the end of the day, yeah, what she has done, I can't forgive her for. Still my daughter, I still love her, but I blame him for the way she was and the way she is now and what she's done. All his doing. That's to me. I'd, I'd strangle the man tomorrow. I gave him half a chance. Well, I mean, I sit, some nights I sit back and think, what did I do wrong that she turned out the way she did? You know, I blame myself sometimes. Starting a fire to frame someone that's got completely out of control, where six children aged 13 or under have died. I can't comprehend it. I really can't. Idiotic, stupid, naive. You can use whatever adjective you, you like, but I think you just have to remember that, you know, it's children, six children. They're no longer here. I really hope Derby gets over this, but I'm not sure it will. I think it will hang over the city for a long time to come. I think the outside world will look at Derby and I think it will go, that's the city where the bloke killed his six kids. <laughs>